Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody from all over the world. Um, my name is Xiao Wenzheng from Sun Yat-sen University, China, uh, Guangzhou, China. I'm the coordinator of the series Air Pollution and Human Health. And last week, we had an uh, excellent introductory uh, presentation. And today, we are going to have the second lecture, Chemistry of the Atmosphere. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to uh, give you a brief introduction of our honor speaker, Professor Robert McLaren. Professor McLaren is the director of the Center for Atmospheric Chemistry. He is the past chair of the Analytical Chemistry Division, which is the largest division of the Chemical Institute of Canada. And Professor McLaren got uh, her uh, PhD degree from the University of Alberta, Canada. He already published about uh, 80 scientific publications. And Professor McLaren had a wide range of research interests. He devoted himself into the development of the new analytical method for probing the chemical composition of the polluted atmosphere. And he's also interested in the the tracing the emission of source transport, transport of the pollutant and their precursor, and chemical and physical transformation processes as well. And Professor McLaren also do the laboratory-based investigation as well as the field studies. Okay, uh, let me turn it over to Professor McLaren. Let's welcome um, Professor McLaren. Now, let me stop sharing. Okay. All right. So uh, maybe you can walk me through how to share uh, my screen now again. Oh, now you see the, 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 the share in the bottom. Yeah. Right. Screen. Yeah, I guess that just the. Green button. You can see on the bottom. Okay. Yeah, right. And can everybody see that now? Yeah, we see everything. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, beautiful. Okay, well, thank you for that kind introduction and welcome everybody wherever you are. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Is the sound okay? Perfect. Yeah. Shaking of heads, so that's great. Um, I'm going to be talking about chemistry of the atmosphere, and uh, I know our audience is kind of wide. Um, I kind of tailored this talk to be more for students to start off with, but I'll throw a few uh, research examples in at the end because um, I understand we do have both uh, students and researchers. And so I'm not going to presume that everybody knows chemistry. So uh, part of the talk at the beginning is an introduction to chemistry uh, for those who are not familiar with chemistry and maybe some interesting ideas that uh, as we go along. So, uh, but I do also understand that a lot of people have an interest in uh, exposure and uh, toxics and that. And so that's what prompted this first slide. This is a, a picture um, taken in uh, Fort McMurray, north of Fort McMurray in the oil sands regions of Alberta. And uh, quite a bit of problems with exposure to uh, at least workers at least, uh, who are exposed to large plumes of uh, um, upgrader processing. And so we can see the air in this particular area is uh, quite dirty and uh, of concern, uh, health concern for people who happen to live in that area. Uh, the First Nations people, and uh, also people who work in that area who may not be familiar with some of the risks. Um, so uh, with that, uh, the outline of my talk, I'm going to talk about, you can't talk about chemistry without talking about other processes in the atmosphere at the same time. So I'll have a bit of an introduction to structure and chemical composition. We'll talk briefly about what drives chemical reactions, thermodynamics, uh, chemical kinetics, uh, the lifetimes of species in the atmosphere, um, the drivers of chemical reactions, which are radicals very often, and uh, the chemical precursors to those radicals. And then if we have time at the end, I'll throw in a few research examples from some of our recent measurements. 
I, I figure people may be interested in, in Hono because uh, it, it's uh, a species that's of emerging concern for perhaps indoor environments, but outdoor environments as well, but indoor environments in particular. Um, and and uh, I'll talk about some measurements of, uh, if I have time, SO2 and NOx measurements from cities using mobile DOA. So it's not really designed to be a research talk, um, uh, and ho hopefully that's okay. Okay, the structure of the atmosphere. We'll start off. Uh, this slide shows the the temperature and pressure structure of the atmosphere as we go up in the atmosphere vertically, away from the surface. And of course, this is the temperature, and we have room temperature down here, about uh, 295 to 300 at the surface. And so uh, the uh, structure of the atmosphere is dictated by the temperature. And the temperature is shown by this line. So we have a decrease in temperature as we go up in the troposphere, and then it turns over and starts to increase. And this gives us the stratosphere and the mesosphere and the thermosphere, et cetera. So uh, we have to consider that we do have an exponential decrease in pressure with height dictated by the barometric law. We have a scale height in the atmosphere of roughly eight kilometers. Um, uh, usually we don't have to consider this uh, if we're talking about exposure at the surface, but um, we do if we're talking about people that are living at elevated elevations, the fact that the, um, the pressure will decrease. And if the pressure decreases, that means the concentration of species that people are exposed to will also be decreasing uh, with height. Um, so, uh, and we also do have to consider the fact that the temperature will change with height. Normally we have the, the adiabatic lapse rate theoretically tells us that we have a, a roughly 10 Kelvin per kilometer drop in temperature as we go up in the atmosphere, at least in the troposphere. Um, but it's, it's a little bit lower than that in reality. Um, and so again, if we're talking about uh, chemistry and the fact that temperature can change the rates of chemical reactions, we might have to consider this decrease in temperature uh, with height. And of course, most of the action that we're talking about is in the planetary boundary layer and our exposure of people uh, is in that surface layer. So this is where most of our concern is, is in this bottom layer of the atmosphere. But even with the, in that bottom layer, pressure changes, concentration changes, uh, and so exposure will change as well. The next slide is a picture of uh, smog. You probably you may have seen this picture before. It's a picture of smog in Los Angeles, and so it's very clear that um, and, and you know the the color of the smog and there it tends to be a cap in this, and that's due to the um, the uh, boundary layer, the mixed boundary layer. The temperature does something like this. So there is a decrease in temperature with height, and the observed lapse rate may be about 7 Kelvin per kilometer instead of the theoretical 10, um, likely due to the condensation of water as well, which adds heat um, uh, as we go up in the atmosphere. And so the observed rate can be different than the theoretical rate. So very often we have the subsidence inversion, uh, that is, we have an increase in temperature uh, here, and that creates an inversion which traps pollutants into this lower layer. And so we have emissions from anthropogenic sources uh, that go into this box and, and they're trapped in, in that layer. And so the concentrations tend to be very high uh, in that bottom layer, which can be uh, anywhere from a few hundred meters high up to two kilometers high. Um, uh, above that, we have the, the, the free uh, troposphere, which tends to be uh, much cleaner uh, depending on where we are. Um, but our exposure is in this polluted layer, uh, which is, um, and, and, and the concentration of species can be dictated by, by how high that layer is. Okay, so this layer, if it's a few hundred meters, it's very shallow and, and the pollutants are trapped in a very tight layer. Um, but that can rise as the day goes on. So our exposure to chemical species uh, as the day proceeds can be less depending on what they are, if they're primary or secondary species. Um, at night, we can get a different picture. So at night, we can form a nocturnal boundary layer due to, uh, we, we call it a radiative inversion. Uh, 
And so we can pick this out if we go up in the atmosphere and measure the, the temperature or the potential temperature. So this is a, a slide that comes from a, a paper by uh, Steve Brown at NOAA in 2007 in which they did measurements on a tall tower. So um, here we have height above the surface layer going from zero to 300 meters, so it's a fairly tall tower. And they were able to outfit this tower with, with um, instruments that can measure chemical species as we go up in the atmosphere. And so they could go up and down and up and down through this tower many times to measure what's happening in the atmosphere vertically. And normally we don't think about that. When we think about exposure of populations at the surface, we think that everything's mixed in the atmosphere and it's the same, but we can have a very different picture. So the potential temperature, here we see a clear inversion, a tight surface inversion, the temperature's increasing. So pollutants that are being emitted here are obviously gonna be trapped in a tight surface layer. But after we get above that surface layer, if we have some mixing, uh, the nocturnal boundary layer has another inversion up here. And so at night, that uh, this, this is a typical number. A nocturnal boundary layer can have an inversion at about uh, 100 to 150 meters. So again, uh, and there's not very, uh, at night, there's not a, a tremendous amount of mixing in the atmosphere. And so whatever is emitted into the surface layer tends to stay very low down. So we can have much higher concentrations at night due to this. Um, so uh, this is again uh, the irradiative cooling, so it's a, a nocturnal boundary layer. And again, I'm thinking about exposure uh, of people to pollutants. And uh, so we can get a very different picture of exposure if somebody's at the surface or um, if they're uh, more elevated. So we just, if we're just look up 100 meters, the chemistry can be very different. So here's an example of how the chemistry can be different and how people's exposure can be different depending on where they are vertically, whether they're living at the surface or whether they're uh, living in a condominium where they're elevated a few hundred meters or whether they're living in a, a, a subdivision that happens to be on top of a mountain and so their their house is up here and so their their exposures can be very different just by by moving vertically a hundred or a few hundred meters okay so uh, the measurements that he was doing was of the uh, the nitrate radical so if we multiply these or divide these numbers by 10 this is about 20 parts per trillion. So the nitrate radical at the top of the um, nocturnal boundary layer is about 20 parts per trillion, but we can see there's a, a rapid change in chemistry as we get above that, as we get into what's called the residual layer, which is what's left over from the previous day. And so measurements of NO3, the NO3 radical is much higher up there. The N2O5 radical tends to drop off and then it increases. But many of us who are talking about exposure of populations think about species such as nitrogen dioxide and ozone. And so ozone at the surface can be quite low, which is typical. Um, but as we go up, uh, the, the ozone can increase tremendously um, to usually background level. So 40 or 50 parts per, per billion in this case. Uh, but NO2 can decrease. So NO2 and ozone are important in that, at least in Canada, they are species that are involved with uh, calculating the health index. So the air quality health index in Canada is uh, a, a weighted measure of people's exposure to NO2, ozone, and PM2.5, particles less than 2.5 micrometers. And the NO2 very often uh, is in there, as far as I understand, in that it is a surrogate. It's a known surrogate for health effects, and the exact reason for all those health effects may not exactly be known, but there may be other things that correlate with NO2, uh, and, and so it is part of the health index. So we can see that there's a different type of exposure for somebody that's living above the surface in a housing development that's on top of a hill, that is, they have more exposure to ozone, but they have less exposure to NO2 and species that may be associated with uh, NO2. And, you know, PM2.5 would, uh, would follow NO2, and that PM2.5 would be elevated close to the surface and then would drop off as we go up. And so we have to consider what's going on vertically uh, in the atmosphere.
I've shown you that the chemistry can be different in the residual layer, uh, but we could also um, con consider other species as well. So here's a, a temperature structure of the atmosphere. So we're, we have a 24 hour period going from, from sunrise in the morning to the next sunrise. And so in the middle of the day in this period right here, when the sun's out and it's driving mixing, we have a planetary boundary layer, which again could be typically up to this, in this case, one and a half kilometers. And so species will be well mixed in, in, in this area here. And so we could be talking about um, a mixture of NOx from anthropogenic sources and a mixture of perhaps biogenic sources as well, as will be shown on the next slide. And, and uh, during the daytime, we know that uh, biogenics very often have, uh, let's see if I can write, isoprene. So we could have isoprene emissions that, which really are dominated during the daytime from biogenic species. Um, uh, at nighttime though, uh, isoprene uh, production shuts off and um, monoterpene emissions from uh, trees that do emit monoterpenes can, uh, can dominate. So we have this nocturnal boundary layer at nighttime, uh, which can be again just 100 meters. But uh, if we consider what's going on here vertically at night, we have different chemistry in here. We could have uh, monoterpene emitters interacting with NOx, whereas in the residual layer, we could have isoprene uh, interacting with NOx and decaying away at the same time. So we have vertically very different chemistry that can be occurring in the residual layer versus the nocturnal boundary layer and with implications for exposure. Okay, so this, this paper, if you're interested in going to look at this, this was a recent review of um, nitrate radicals and their reactions with biogenic volatile organic compounds. Uh, so there are many co-authors on this. this the lead was uh, Sally Ying um, and uh, Steve Brown who led this. Um, but the, the idea is that we do have anthropogenic emissions of NOx, which we can do something about, uh, but, uh, and, and they will form, form ozone downwind. But these anthropogenic species can interact with natural species, that is biogenics. And so we can have at the key of this, the nitrate radical at night, which can react with, of course, these double bonds for isoprene and with monoterpenes, um, it can react with, with these species quite, quite quickly and form um, organic nitrates. And organic nitrates can have um, different toxicities um, and, and, uh, for, for exposure of people. So for example, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, they, they're known to be toxic. Uh, but nitrated uh, PAHs can be much more toxic than the, just the straight hydrocarbons themselves. And so, um, you know, this interaction of anthropogenic species with natural species uh, downwind, and, and, and so it has implications for air quality, climate, and, uh, and population exposure. So you can have a look at that. I do, I'm not sure if people get a copy of these slides afterwards. I can certainly provide a copy of the, this. Um, so some of the consequences of the pressure and temperature structure of the atmosphere, some of the things I've just calculated in this table, most of what we're talking about is sea level. We go up in the atmosphere, way out to the exosphere. And so I've calculated some things, typical temperatures, uh, pressures as we go up, um, average molecular speeds. So this is what dictates how successful a chemical reaction would be. I've simply calculated the molecular speed for nitrogen. And so the speed is, is dependent on the temperature. This term comes from uh, kinetic molecular theory. Um, the number density of species. So as an atmospheric uh, chemist, I would be using number density in molecules per meter cube or molecules per centimeter cubed. And so the number densities as we go fall off, as we go up into the atmosphere by many orders of magnitude. Uh, the collision frequency, which also dictates how quick a reaction goes. So we can have about uh, 10 billion collisions per second of a nitrogen molecule. 
at sea level and we get way up into the exosphere and it drops off significantly. And the mean free path, which is the, um, uh, the average distance that a molecule can travel before it collides with something else. So um, again, I'm not sure if people get a copy of these slides afterwards, but I can certainly provide them with just some of the equations on how you would calculate all of these species and where they come from, the, these parameters. Okay, how do we quantify species in the atmosphere? Uh, well, not all of these are, are directly relevant, but uh, you'll, you'll come across these uh, as an atmospheric scientist and as a chemist. So we could talk about global mass in the atmosphere, the global burden in terms of moles in the atmosphere. The atmosphere contains about two times 10 to the 20 moles of gas. And so this is, these are useful numbers to have if you want to calculate uh, global uh, burdens. Um, but usually we're concerned with the numbers in red, that is the concentration, uh, a, a number density, for example, molecules per centimeter cubed is what's typically used by atmospheric chemists when doing kinetics. Um, many other people use mixing ratios. So here I've got air molecules and in this particular uh, column here I have typical levels of ozone. So a mixing ratio of ozone, a background mixing ratio, maybe 40 parts per billion. Um, we can calculate its number density, which is about uh, 10 to the 12 molecules per centimeter cubed at sea level. Um, and the uh, we could a lot of people use mass density. I'm a, I'm a chemist, so I don't like mass so much. I like moles. Um, so moles or mixing ratio. Um, very often people talk about a mixing ratio being a concentration, and of course it isn't a concentration. The beauty of using mixing ratios is that for species that are well mixed in the atmosphere, that are homogeneous in the atmosphere, their mixing ratio is constant, even as you go up in the atmosphere, <clears throat> even though the pressure in, uh, uh, can decrease by an order of magnitude, uh, almost an order of magnitude by the time you get to the top of the troposphere. So that the mixing ratio may be constant, but the concentration uh, it can fall off tremendously by, as I say, an order of magnitude. So um, you have to be aware that a, a mixing ratio is not really a concentration. Uh, it's just a ratio of, of the uh, moles of your analyte to the moles of air that are present. Um, but if people are living at elevate, elevations, you may have to consider their exposure to concentrations. That is amount per volume, which is a concentration. Okay, calculating some of these species. Again, just some equations that you would use. So I don't want to uh, belabor these, but um, if you're, you're going to have to Intercompare, intercompare or convert between these different species that you'll see in the literature. Number densities in molecules per centimeter cubed, you would use this, this equation right here to calculate these. Uh, this is our mixing ratio. So our mixing ratio, again, is a ratio of moles to moles, uh, moles of analyte to moles of uh, air or pressure to pressure. Uh, and you can use uh, these equations to calculate mass densities and number densities based on a, a mixing ratio. Uh, less common is, uh, but, but coming up, people are war more aware of this now, uh, measurements of column amounts. And the, what a column is, is simply if you were to um, uh, make a total measure of what's in the atmosphere. So it's an integrated measure of our concentration over the height in the vertical. Um, and so, and the reason why it's important is that we're getting more and more exposure to satellite measurements. So there's more satellites that are going up that are able to measure species in the atmosphere, such as uh, NO2 and formaldehyde and methane um, and, and other species as well. And so we're now getting global coverage of um, column measurements of these species, which doesn't necessarily tell us what's at the surface, but more and more people are trying to link these satellite measurements to, to uh, exposure of populations, to, so to link it to health. Um, and so uh, I'll talk a little bit about, we do column measurements as well using Max DOAS. So we have a telescope that can measure what's in the atmosphere and, and so we can measure columns. Uh, in the atmosphere, so we use that measure frequently, and it's a useful measure sometimes, um, as you'll see by the end of the lecture. Okay, the um, 
chemical composition of the atmosphere, for most people know this, so uh, some of the major species, nitrogen 78, oxygen 21, argon 1%, water is variable, carbon dioxide 410 parts per million and, and growing at about two to three parts per million per year at the current time. Uh, some of the inert tracers, which we normally don't think about because they don't do very much chemistry, the noble gases, argon, neon, and helium, but they're certainly there. At, uh, at, at actually significant levels. I mean, argon's about 1% in the atmosphere, but we don't talk about its chemistry basically because it doesn't have any chemistry. Um, methane, about 1.8 per parts per million, the largest organic compound in the atmosphere and increasing at the current time. Um, it's a little bit higher than 1.8 right now, I think. And then at the bottom, some typical um, compositions at least in terms of mixing ratios of um, species that we may be interested in when we're talking about health. So carbon monoxide, <clears throat> so these are background levels. They could be much higher in urban areas. So uh, carbon monoxide at, at 80 parts per billion, that's a southern hemispheric background level might be about 60, a northern hemispheric background might be about 80. Uh, but you really have to push yourself to find an area where you can measure 80 parts per billion of carbon monoxide in the northern hemisphere. It's usually hundreds of parts per billion uh, to parts per million in urban areas that we're talking about. Ozone, typical background levels, 30 parts per billion, but uh, can certainly go up to 100 or hundreds of parts per billion during photochemical smog events or even during winter ozone formation event, events in fracking regions in, in Utah, which we've done a little bit of work on, a rather interesting counter to all the chemistry that we've ever known about ozone formation. You have these very strange phenomena in fracking regions in, in Utah and Wyoming where um, you get very rapid ozone formation uh, during the daytime only when snow is present and only when it's very cold. Uh, which is really counter to everything we thought about in terms of ozone chemistry. Normally we think of ozone as being a smog uh, species uh, that we only consider when it's very hot out and very warm and you're in Los Angeles or Vancouver or somewhere like that where you get this secondary formation of ozone. But here we have these regions that are very, very cold and when it snows, the uh, ozone formation goes very high and you get 150 parts per billion of ozone in a fracking region. So uh, that's just kind of interesting in that it's very different in terms of the chemistry and, and the physics. Um, other species, NO2 and benzene, for example, might be of interest to people for, for toxics and to health exposures. So um, in, in say Toronto, we certainly see 101 to 100 parts per billion. The 100 parts per billion we would only see at night or early in the morning and only occasionally, but 50 parts per billion is, is uh, very typical and not unheard of. Uh, benzene, when I first did measurements of benzene in Toronto, we were seeing one to two parts per billion. Now the levels tend to be a, a hundreds of parts per trillion. The amount of Benzene in gasoline has been reduced, and therefore the amount in the ambient atmosphere has reduced. Uh, these are ambient levels that are kind of wide uh, throughout the whole area. Um, but certainly, if you got into canyons, your exposure, your levels could be much, much higher than this. So you could get up to uh, <clears throat> several parts, tens of parts per billion for for benzene and other toxic species. Okay, so we're talking about um, chemistry in the atmosphere. So um, again, this little slide shows what would happen as you uh, uh, moved away. So we've got primary sources of pollution. We've got uh, natural sources of uh, pollution uh, or at least organic compounds, whether you call it pollution or not is a different thing. But certainly when they transform, you can certainly get pollutants. So we have the interaction of NOx from primary sources with organic compounds, so we have chemical reactions that can occur as we move away from the source. Of course, we have transport and dilution, <clears throat> so these are physical reasons why we would have a reduction in concentration, uh, but uh, we could also have chemical reactions that are occurring at the same time. So uh, I'm just gonna draw on the slide here. It's interesting to consider as you move away from the source, from left to right, what would the profile look like in terms of our 
concentration of a species. So let's put mixing ratio of a species as a function of the distance as we move away from the source. And you get very different behavior for a primary source, something that we could consider to be um, a tracer, something like uh, carbon monoxide or SO2. So as you move away from the source, you, most of your emission is close to the source, and so the typical profile would look something in terms of concentration or mixing ratio as a function of space as we move away from the source would look something like this. That is, we would have some type of first order decay in the concentration of this species as we move away. <clears throat> and that's very different for um, secondary species, secondary pollutants, such as ozone or uh, perhaps peroxyacetyl nitrate which is formed during um, smog events, and it's an eye irritant. Um, so secondary species like that would have a profile where very typically they would start off, start off very low because they don't come from uh, primary sources. Uh, they're only formed chemically in the atmosphere. <clears throat> so these species might look something like this. They start off low in the atmosphere where populations are, but somewhere downwind they'll maximize and then start to decay away. So we would have to consider this when we think about either primary or secondary species. So this would be ozone or um, pan, for example. They would look something like this. And the peak in concentration and where, where people are exposed could be 50 to 100 kilometers away. And it will depend on the wind speed and dilution and all those types of things as well. But um, very different spatial profiles for these different pollutants. All right, uh, <clears throat> we could consider the, um, you know, you should be aware if you're going to do any photochemical modeling uh, or any modeling, uh, but even if you're not, uh, the mass balance equation, this is what you would use to dictate if we had a small box. This small box could be the whole globe, the whole burden of the atmosphere, or it could be a small one centimeter cubed. We consider the concentration of a species that somebody's breathing in in one centimeter cubed. And so the mass balance equation dictates the rate of change of a species. We're just gonna call it generally M. So dm by dt, the rate of change, is equal to the sum of the sources minus the sum, sum of the sinks. And the sources could be emission into the box, uh, chemical production from a chemical reaction, we can consider meteorology, that is movement of from one box to another, if you were in a photochemical model. <clears throat> and then the sinks are things that uh, uh, take species out of the box. So again, we've got chemical reactions, so we can have a chemical loss. And then we have physical processes, de de uh, deposition in terms of wet and dry at the surface, um, but also flow out of the box. So this dictates what what is going to happen to the concentration of the species in this box. And um, if uh, the sources are greater than the sinks, then of course the dm by dt is going to be greater than zero. So this is going to increase. Uh, so this is the case for something like CO2 in the atmosphere. Right now the sources are greater than the sinks, so CO2 is climbing in the atmosphere, uh, where our box now is the whole global atmosphere, um, or methane as well. Um, and uh, if sources are less than sinks, uh, then our rate of change, uh, sorry, our rate of change, de or the amount in the box decreases. And if sources are equal to sinks, then of course the, we have steady state and the mass is constant. So we could have an equilibrium constant or just a steady state where the sources are matching the sinks. Okay, so that's the mass balance equation, which might be of interest. So talking about chemical reactions, what drives chemical reactions? I'm going to talk about three or four things here, just general. So this is a reminder. Um, ultimately, which reactions go? I mean, it's not random. Some reactions go and some don't. And ultimately, the reactions that do go forward are dictated by thermodynamics. So we have to consider the energetics of the molecule, both its enthalpy and entropy. So we could think of the energy stored in chemical bonds as perhaps measured by the uh, enthalpy. And the entropy is the amount of disorder. So uh, that drives a lot of chemical reactions um, as well. Um, the 
thermodynamics tells us, can tell us if a reaction will go or not, but it doesn't tell us how fast that reaction goes. So some reactions may be thermodynamically favorable, but they have an activation barrier, which is far too high. So they take too long to get there. So that's a, how fast reactions go is dictated by chemical dynamics. Okay, so I'll talk about uh, that briefly. And, but what initiates reactions, really? This is something that we should be aware of. So the, the atmosphere is an oxidizing atmosphere that we have, at least here on Earth, um, uh, where we're dominated by uh, oxygen. The nitrogen, the 78%, doesn't do a lot of chemistry per se, um, but the oxygen does. However, oxygen itself in an oxidizing atmosphere doesn't uh, initiate a lot of the chemistry. That is, it's a stable molecule, it has a double bond. Um, it takes re significant energy to break that double bond. So most chemical reactions don't involve a direct reaction with oxygen uh, with uh, a stable species. Most of them are initiated by radicals. So we'll talk about radicals, and of course, you probably know a lot of the um, important radicals you, you may know during the daytime is the hydroxyl radical, and at nighttime, it could be the NO3 radical. But there are other radicals that are important as well. So very often, these radicals are what initiate reactions and make them go. And so the reactions will not go because the barrier is too high if the radicals are not present, um, or they won't go very fast. So just a reminder, when we talk about thermodynamics, uh, very often we talk about uh, Gibbs free energy. So this is Gibbs free energy delta G. We could talk about the Gibbs free energy of formation of an individual molecule, or we could talk about the, the Gibbs energy the change in Gibbs free energy uh, for a particular reaction. And this equation tells us how it's related to the enthalpy and the entropy. So as entropy increases, that a reaction is favored. Um, the, the delta G of a reaction will go if this number is negative. Okay. So if the delta G of a reaction is negative, it's favorable and it can go spontaneously. Um, reactions that um, have a, a positive delta G of their reaction will not necessarily go unless we have an external source of energy or if we have a life form. Some say that this is perhaps the, the best way to define life forms is that uh, uh, life forms can make reactions go that normally wouldn't um, and due to their energetics. And so, um, you know, for example, we can, we, life forms can fight entropy. Uh, trees can build up carbohydrates. So we're taking CO2 molecules uh, through photosynthesis out of the atmosphere and we're building them into sugars. So you're bringing small molecules together to make bigger molecules, and that's really a process that is really going against entropy to do something like that. And so that could be a definition of, of, of what life really is. Um, uh, you know, species that are fighting against uh, uh, Gibbs free energy and, uh, and, and entropy. Uh, but for non-life forms, chemical reactions in the atmosphere will go if we have products that have large delta G, a negative delta G uh, formation, um, those reactions tend to go. So I've tabulated some delta Gs, the formation of typical species. So we have hydrogen and oxygen species in this column, nitrogen species here, uh, carbon species here, and some sulfur species here. Uh, and so those species that have large negative delta G's of formation tend to be the terminations of many chemical reactions. So for nitrogen, a lot of nitrogen ends up uh, as nitric acid or as nitrates, for example, because of this. For, uh, for hydrogen and oxygen species, uh, water, both in the gas phase and in the liquid phase, have high negative delta G's, and so reactions that form them are favored. <clears throat> for carbon, carbon dioxide itself, uh, ending up as CO2. That's why a lot of oxidation processes end up as CO2. It's the large negative uh, delta G of formation of CO2. And for sulfur species, um, uh, 
sulfuric acid. Uh, this is just the, the delta G formation of sulfuric acid in the aqueous phase because that's normally where it ends up dissolved with water. It doesn't exist in the gas phase for very long before it condenses on itself, forms small particles, and then usually water adds. So um, this uh, is very energetically favorable to form uh, sulfates in particles, uh, especially when there's water present. Okay, so that's just a reminder of the uh, thermodynamics of chemical reactions. The kinetics I'll throw down here, this is just a review of chemical kinetics so we can have a, a general chemical reaction that goes like here. Here we have the stoichiometric coefficient of reactants A and B and G and H. And uh, the rate of the reaction could be, we can pick any product or any reactant and we can measure the rate of a reaction by measuring the rate of change of a species with respect to time. So this is how we would define it. And uh, our rate law for reaction in general would be the rate of a reaction equals our proportionality constant, which we call the rate constant, multiplied by the reactants raised to some stoichiometric coefficient. Now, if this is an overall rate law for a reaction that could have one, two, three, four, five steps, um, we don't know what M and N are a priori. We would actually have to measure what the order of the chemical reaction is. That is, these this order, whether it's first order or second order or third order, or it could be a, a square root order for an overall reaction. We don't know what M and N are, and we'd have to measure it. However, at the bottom, we get down to the bottom here. When we talk about elementary reactions, and very often in atmospheric chemistry, we are looking at uh, individual uh, uh, elementary chemical reactions. We do know what these stoichiometric coefficients are. We can write them down just by looking at the elementary steps. So an example is uh, OH, I'm gonna show this next, OH plus uh, CH4. Okay, so the hydroxyl radical will oxidize methane in the atmosphere to give us water plus CH3 radical. Um, so I'm gonna draw a radical with a little dot. And, and so that is a, there are two species in the reaction. It's an elementary step. So we do know that the rate of the reaction equals the rate constant times concentration of OH times the concentration of methane. Okay, so we can raise the power one because uh, that's the stoichiometric coefficient here. We can do that for an elementary step. So we know that this is a second order reaction overall. It's first order in hydroxyl radical and first order in, in uh, methane. Um, I'll just throw in some more chemistry. The next step here is oxygen. We'll add to this to give us a peroxy radical. Um, and very often that will be followed by NO to NO2 conversion. to an alkoxy radical. Okay, so these are all radical species. Once you have one radical which um, reacts with the methane, and by the way, the, the lifetime of methane is, is nine years in the atmosphere. So an individual methane molecule is stable enough that it can float around for nine years before a hydroxyl radical with significant energy happens to react with it and abstract one of the hydrogens. The rest of the reactions that occur here, these radical reactions, they can occur in milliseconds or, or, or seconds. So this whole process, once a molecule sits around for nine years, it gets initiated by a hydroxyl radical, and then very quickly you can cascade through four or five reactions to get to a final product um, that can take milliseconds or, or seconds perhaps at most. Okay. So that's the rates of, of chemical reactions. Um, I seem to be frozen.
All right, just uh, let's see what we can do about this. Can everybody still hear me? Yeah, can everybody still hear you? I think you just PPT. Could you just do escape to see if anything changed or? Uh, it's not responding to escape. Oh, maybe that won't help. Perhaps try unsharing your screen and then sharing it again. Okay, stop share. And it's not responding to that either. So I just uh, stop. I just take over the sharing from yours, and I I, I stop again. So I check. I stop sharing from your side. Yes. And I go back. No. Would that would that help? Help. No. I'm just going to. Uh... I wonder if it's, uh, well, it doesn't appear to be a wireless connection issue. Let me just try moving. We, we have a very nice. Um, Thanks, the connection is good. Yeah. No, I'm wondering if it's the connection um, here. Can we do some control of the panel on, on your side? Sorry, can I do what? I mean, wait, yeah. wait. Uh, can you do, you know, the remote controlling of the... No, I, I can't have the remote control on from on his side. I try to stop sharing from his side and share from my side. That doesn't help. Maybe just a connection between your um, pointer and the screen or something like that. It looks like everything go working well, except the connection between... Uh, your pointers to get uh, the slide moving, right? Yeah, but the video on my side is not, uh, I'm not seeing any movement in the video as well. Yeah, I just see that it's frozen as well. Yeah. Well, right. So I'm wondering if I can try uh, turning it off and then reconnecting. So there might be mm -hmm. some connection. I wonder if we should do that. Um, I don't know if I can. All right. Um, yeah, I think the video is going back. It's going back? Yeah, the video is back. But, um, uh, it's not moving where I am. Mm -hmm. um, how about if I uh, try a whole shutdown? and then try reconnecting. So I'll rejoin the meeting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, my things seem to be frozen. So I'll shut down uh, the computer and then I'll try and reconnect. So just bear with me for a minute or so. Yeah, no problem. So, okay. Um, well, we are sorry for the technical issue. Um, we have to wait for a couple minutes to uh, Professor McLaren come back. Uh, if we are you able to take control right now? Because we're still seeing uh, his screen on the yeah uh, uh, there. Yeah, I think um, yeah, he just uh, shut down the screen, so he just lost connection. Yeah, uh, 
I can actually yeah, just uh, reshare that by the time. Sorry, everyone, for this uh, inconvenience. It's just uh, when we do things live, right? So. So sometimes it happens, right? The technique issue. Actually, that never that never happened in all the series we have been done. I think it's just the um, the maybe the um, laptop or something that's just been frozen, so we can't do anything while everything's still working. Yep. Oh, good to yeah, have yeah. you back. <laughs> All right, we're back. Yes. Great. I don't see any video of people, though. Are other people connected? Yeah, everybody oh. still be here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Professor McLaren, you have to press the you know, share monitor. The screen. The, yeah. All right. Uh, give me a second. There. All right. Perfect. I think we're almost back. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm going to skip through this. So that's kinetics. Um, temperature dependence of chemical reactions. So as I said, I, I'm using an example here of methane reacting with hydroxyl radical. And we said we do have to consider the temperature dependence. If you go and look up rate constants uh, that are in the literature or in uh, databases, a lot of them are tabulated 298K, which may be relevant for exposure studies uh, or for health impacts, um, but it may not be. And so uh, if you consider the temperature outside today in Toronto, where it's about minus five degrees Celsius or minus 10 degrees Celsius, I believe, oh, it's, it's actually minus 13 degrees Celsius here right now. So um, quite cold. And so the temperature dependence really matters. Um, so you'll see a tabulation of, uh, you know, a rate constant at 298, but it can be very different. So the temperature dependence of most chemical reaction is driven by the Arrhenius equation. And so that's shown on the right where we have a pre-exponential factor called A and then we have an exponential factor. And so the exponential factor really dictates the fraction of molecules that have sufficient energy and energy greater than the activation energy necessary for the reaction to go. And um, the pre-exponential factor uh, takes into account things such as the collision frequency, how, how frequent do molecules collide with each other um, and but do they collide with the correct orientation as well for a reaction to occur? And so, um, you know, that's what the pre-exponential factor is. So all of these factors are needed. Um, the activation energy very often is the energy necessary to break a chemical bond. So if we're talking about hydroxyl radical coming together with methane, as I said, a methane molecule in the atmosphere can live for about nine years on average. 
um, and eventually a collision comes along that has enough energy to break that very strong carbon-hydrogen bond, which is 439 kilojoules per mole. That needs to be broken, and when it is, we form, you know, so we're breaking this chemical bond here, we're reforming another bond here, and water molecule is being created. And this will go away as a, a, a methyl radical and, and water being formed. So this energy to break this bond, uh, this is what drives the temperature dependence. And so as we increase the temperature, those collisions become much more energetic and more molecules, more collisions will have sufficient energy to break that chemical bond and take us down to products. So most chemical reactions have a positive temperature coefficient. That is, as you increase the temperature, uh, the, the, the reaction rate will go up. And a rule of thumb is um, for every 10 degrees increase in temperature, you'll double the rate of a reaction. That's for an average um, activation energy. It's not true for all species. And it's not even true that all chemical reactions have positive temperature coefficients. Some have negative. So if you look at hydroxyl radical reacting with something like benzene, for example, or some ring opening reactions, addition to um, toluene, uh, addition of OH to toluene, it can have a negative temperature coefficient. And that's uh, due to the fact that the, the transition state can fall apart. So as you increase the temperature, um, that transition state is not favored. Okay, so a lot, of, a lot of temperature reactions do increase with temperature, but there are a few that will decrease with temperature. Okay, so here's what the temperature dependence of the OH plus methane reaction looks like. And so we can plot the uh, log of the rate coefficient versus 1 over T. We get a straight line. That's how we tell that it's a, um, a first order, at least in uh, a OH radical concentration. Um, if we now plot the rate of this chemical reaction divided by its rate calculated at 298, if you were going to use that rate constant and plot that as a function of temperature, you see that you get very different values. So, for example, I can calculate the lifetime of methane in the atmosphere at room temperature, and I get a number there, which is 1, the temperature using the rate constant at 298. But if I consider, if I ask the question, what is the lifetime of methane, or how quickly does that reaction go at a lower temperature in the atmosphere? And most of methane in the atmosphere is in a region where there are lower temperatures, say for example, 240 K, I get a, a, a rate constant that's only about 20% of the rate constant up here. So that's quite significant. And it's the main reason why if you calculate the lifetime of methane, um, at room temperature, you get about 4.7 year, 4 point something years. But if you calculate it at an average temperature of the atmosphere of about 250K or 240K, you get 9.3 years. So this is the observed lifetime of methane, which is much longer than what you would calculate at 298. So if you're calculating lifetime of species, organic species, toxic species, you want to calculate their lifetime, you may need to look at these rate constants and you may need to recalculate them in different conditions, um, wintertime versus summertime. So how do we define the lifetime of a molecule? This is the, uh, go and look at Jacob's textbook, Introduction to Atmospheric Chemistry. This is the general definition of how you would calculate a lifetime. The lifetime of a species is given by the amount of a species. Uh, this could be amount, again, in a box. It could be um, its concentration in a one cubic centimeter. And we divide that by its loss rate from that box. And the loss is usually a chemical reaction that we're talking about. Um, and so with this general lifetime definition, one can calculate the lifetime of a first order reaction. So the amount in the box is M, this could be any measure, concentration, and the loss rate is Km, the rate constant multiplied by M. And so we get this general result that for a first order reaction, for a first order loss process, the lifetime of the molecule is just the inverse of the rate constant. And so, and the lifetime of a species is, you know, for a first order process, 
is the time it takes to fall to, it's the E folding time, the time it takes to fall to one over E of its original concentration uh, if it were decreasing. Okay, so that's about 36% of its original value. Okay, but you can use this general lifetime for calculating um, the lifetime of second order processes as well. Okay, so that might be useful. Common lifetimes in the atmosphere, some of them are tabulated here. Uh, the species that have long lifetimes, nitrogen and oxygen, a million years for nitrogen in the atmosphere, 5,000 years for oxygen. Um, CFCs, which we care about for stratospheric ozone loss, uh, 20 to 150 years, uh, perhaps. Uh, methane, 9.3 years. Uh, and then we get into some species that we may be interested in at the surface. Carbon monoxide, about two months. Uh, nitric oxide, a half to two days. Nitrogen dioxide, uh, a few hours sometimes, up to two days, depending on conditions. Um, and then more toxic species, benzene, one to five days, uh, based on its rate with the hydroxyl radical. 1,3-butadiene, uh, another toxic species. Um, 30 minutes up to 12 hours, depending on the concentration of hydroxyl radical. Um, and then we get down to the radicals themselves, just to show you the range, the average lifetime. So nitrate radical, we've measured lifetimes of this species. We measure this via DOAS. Uh, and so we've measured in some environments, typical one to two minutes at night is its lifetime. During the day, um, less than 10 seconds. It photolyzes very quickly, so its lifetime is much uh, shorter. And then the hydroxyl radical itself, and we could add chlorine radicals as well, you know, they're a second or less, okay? So they don't live very long, they're formed and they're gone, they react with something, very short lifetimes. Okay. Radicals and drivers of chemical reactions is what the next topic is about. And so again, the, our atmosphere is an oxidizing atmosphere, uh, but the um, amount of energy required to break the oxygen molecule itself because of that strong double bond, 498 kilojoules per mole, uh, if we're gonna photolyze it, it requires a photon that has an energy uh, equivalent to a photon with, of 240 nanometers. So as we go to smaller wavelengths, photons have more energy, so we need a, this doesn't, uh, uh, wavelengths less than 240 nanometers do not exist at the surface. They're all absorbed by ozone up in the stratosphere. And so we do not break oxygen chemical bonds in the lower troposphere due to photolysis, due to the fact that we have an absence of, uh, an actinic flux that has sufficient photons less than 240 nanometers. Ozone, on the other hand, we can. So ozone uh, has a uh, average bond energy of 364 kilojoules per mole. It's less. We require uh, photons less than 330 nanometers to break that, to photolyze it, and that does exist. So we can do that at the surface. And then we go to even something weaker. So an oxygen-oxygen bond in a peroxide something like uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, and so very weak bonds. So these are weak enough that they can thermally decompose, just thermally break, and uh, uh, so they're very easily photolyzed. Uh, something else, chlorine, for example, okay, its, it's energy, is, uh, its bond is weak enough that it can be photolyzed by visible light uh, quite easily. Okay. So oxidation is usually an, it initiated by radicals. Um, and I'll talk about some of the radicals. Light is an important initiator as well. So we've got radicals that can drive chemical reactions, but we also can add energy in the form of light. So we call that photochemistry. So photochemistry is very important in the atmosphere. A lot of reactions are driven by photochemistry. So here's just some reactions. This would occur in the, the, the stratosphere. This is the initiation reaction um, in the Chapman mechanism for the formation of ozone in the stratosphere. Uh, at the surface, we can photolyze an ozone molecule itself to initiate chemistry um, to split apart one of the oxygen atoms from molecular oxygen, <clears throat> or we can photolyze uh, peroxide, for example. Okay. 
just a definition of a lot of radicals uh, that can initiate chemistry. These compounds have a total uh, non-zero electron spin. That means they usually have at least uh, one unpaired electron, and that usually implies an odd number of electrons. And they are reactive due to the fact that they have an odd number of electrons and they're an open shell. And so here's all the examples that I could think of and threw down on the slide. These are all radical species. And so they will initiate chemistry. <clears throat> and that it also means they have very short lifetimes as well. So in hydrogen atom itself, usually its next reaction is uh, it will react with molecular oxygen to give you HO2. So that's a, a species right here. So we have interconversion of hydrogen to HO2, and we can have interconversion of HO2 back to OH. Um, all of these I've drawn with a little dot beside them. The dot is the symbol for a radical, meaning an un, uh, uh, uneven number of electrons. Um, chlorine is a re radical that's it's quite reactive and more of concern, or at least we're becoming educated on the prevalence of chlorine as a radical in the atmosphere. Um, and a bunch of the other ones, I'll just, I'll just leave them there and, and let you look through those. But uh, the main radicals during the daytime, hydroxyl radical uh, during the day and at night, it's the um, nitrate radical, which drive a lot of chemistry. Okay, radical precursors. So we can form these radicals, but where do they come from? And uh, so radical precursors are usually photolabile species. That is, they're, they're stable um, if there's no photons. Um, but uh, so they can very often build up overnight or in the dark. So now we have to consider indoor environments, indoor air quality, for example, is that very often it's darker indoors than it is outdoors. And so we can have some of these photolabile species building up in indoor environments, which could be releasing radicals at a much slower rate um, in, in indoor environments and doing some chemistry. Um, so uh, Ozone itself is a, uh, a, a radical precursor. That is, it will photolyze to give O singlet D, a particular state of oxygen plus molecular oxygen, and that will react with water to give hydroxyl radicals, which do a lot of daytime chemistry. Since 2008, uh, first publication on uh, nitro chloride um, by Hans Ostoff, in, who's now in Calgary, um, he was working with NOAA and they did uh, the first measurements that showed high levels of nitro chloride in the atmosphere using chemical ionization mass spec. So this species can build up at night um, and it's due to the reaction of N2O5 reacting heterogeneously on aerosols that have chloride present. Uh, this can build up at night and when it's released in the morning it'll photolyze quickly to give you a chlorine radical and that chlorine rattle radical can be very reactive and drive even more chemistry than hydroxyl radical does. Chlorine itself, if it's formed, can also release radicals and HONO. So HONO is one that's present in the ambient atmosphere. It builds up every night. Um, we've measured it in environments in around Vancouver over the oceans. Uh, we've measured it in Toronto. Levels tend to be typically about one parts per billion that it will build up to. Um, we've measured it in the oil sands region and it was uh, roughly 300 parts per trillion at night, but in the morning it will photolyze and release hydroxyl radicals. Okay, so um, some of this chemistry is summarized here. This is a busy slide which has a lot of chemistry and it shows us the difference between day and night chemistry. So <clears throat> during the day, hydroxyl radical, this is the chemistry that goes on during the day. So this is a cartoon slide of chemistry, but you'll recognize that this is the, <clears throat> the ozone, photochemical ozone formation uh, uh, mechanism. That is hydroxyl radical reacts with VOCs to give us uh, an alkyl peroxy radical when oxygen's present. And this, this species will react with NO and convert it to NO2. 
So we have this conversion of NO to NO2, which is aided by these alkyl peroxy radicals, which require the presence of hydroxyl radical. The NO2 photolyzes to give us an oxygen atom, and that very quickly reacts with molecular oxygen to give us ozone. Okay, so this is our cycle. This cycle will run around and it requires the presence of hydroxyl radical. It occurs during the daytime. It requires the sun to be out. And so um, this is daytime chemistry that's occurring in the middle of the slide. <clears throat> At night, we have a different type of chemistry. Again, the, ni the nitrate radical can dominate. It's not there during the day because it photolyzes very quickly. So it doesn't build up till nighttime. Uh, but it can react with uh, biogenic species, as we mentioned, um, to give us uh, nitrate species and other polar species, which can condense onto particles. Um, but it also reacts uh, inorganically with NO2. So it further reacts to form N2O5, which is nitric acid and anhydride. So it's two nitric acids minus the water molecule. And N2O5, this chain, uh, this uh, is, is responsible uh, for, so the next step is this, N2O5 will react with water heterogeneously very uh, mostly to form nitric acid. So this nighttime step can be responsible for about 50% of NOx removal from the atmosphere. That is, NOx is emitted as NO and NO2, that's NOx, and some of it's uh, removed during the day due to, uh, re it's not shown on the slide, but it will re react with hydroxyl radicals during the day to give us HNO3. So that's one removal mechanism. And it turns out it's about 50-50. But at night, this channel is about 50% as well. About 50% is removed through this chain of formation of a nitrate radical, conversion to N2O5, and then heterogeneous reactions on aerosols uh, with water to form nitric acid. That removes about 50% of NOx from the atmosphere as well. The interesting chemistry that came around in 2008 was the fact that if there's chloride in these aerosols, then N2O5 can react to form nitrochloride, this radical precursor. And as we, if we go from day to night, going from the right side of the slide to the left-hand side of the slide, that will give us Cl2 and ClNO2, which photolyze early in the morning and give us a burst of radicals. That is the chlorine radical that start initiating some of this chemistry. That's also true for um, Hono. So Hono is an interesting species that's present in the ambient atmosphere. It's also present in indoor environments. It's present wherever you have NO2. So it can build up in the dark at night to give us Hono, which will also photolyze and uh, give us hydroxyl radical again. So uh, Hono can give us a burst of hydroxyl radicals early in the morning. It can be the dominant hydroxyl radical source early in the morning at the surface in many environments. Okay, so, and of course, this is a question mark. N205 uh, reacting on surfaces that have chloride to form nitrile chloride. Okay, formation of OH, where does it come from during the day? <clears throat> this is the mechanism. Uh, it comes from pho photolysis of ozone itself to give us a no singlet D, which will react with water to produce hydroxyl radicals. So that's really thought of to be the main source of hydroxyl radical um, in very sunny uh, conditions where you have a lot of sunlight present. Not necessarily true in winter time as a source of hydroxyl radical. It may not be the main source um, or in northern latitudes. And so um, other sources of OH that we have to consider, OH, uh, HONO itself, and photolysis of other species such as formaldehyde or other aldehydes, they can give us OH as well, ultimately. So these species. Uh, we we've done some measurements uh, in the oil sands regions uh, of uh, Alberta, which is at uh, 50, oh, it's over 50 degrees latitude. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it's 57 degrees latitude or if it's 53. It's one of those numbers. It's much further north, and so the actinic flux is much different, and it's redder. Uh, 
And so in, at least in that environment, um, HONO can be a major source measured in the morning, be up, responsible for 80% of the OH generation in the morning, um, whereas formaldehyde can give us another 20% uh, percent perhaps, and uh, ozone a lesser amount. Okay, so it's not all ozone photolysis, although that is a main source of hydroxyl globally. So lifetimes due to OH reactions, um, these are really technically second order reactions. So any organic RH will react with hydroxyl to give us this, this is the rate limiting step. And the rate would be equal to, since an elementary step, the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of the organic multiplied by hydroxyl radical. And we can rearrange that to get this equation right here. That is, if you, want to, if you have a toxic organic species and you want to calculate its lifetime in different environments, you can do this yourself. If you have a value for the rate constant and you have a value for the concentration of hydroxyl radical, and so you can get a first order of magnitude estimate of this by using the global concentration of hydroxyl radical, which is about a million molecules per cubic centimeter. That's the, the average lifetime, across, sorry, that's the average concentration across the globe, day and night. Uh, now, most of it is present during the day. So for long lived species, this will work to use this number for species that have lifetimes that are more than a few days. This will give you the lifetime of the species, but if it's less than a day, um, it'll be much different. Okay, um, there's some average lifetime of species that are calculated here using that equation. Um, Nighttime, how am I doing for time? I guess I'm uh, a little bit late on time, but. Um, I, can I can wrap up at any time. Uh, I can give you one example of some research. Uh, please, uh, Professor uh, McLaren. Yeah, we are quite, uh, quite late in time. So if you could uh, please uh, give a very uh, brief um, research example, and then uh, we could wrap up, please. Okay, I'll give a very brief research example. Uh, I mean, we do lots of things in our group. We measure NO3, so we do nighttime chemistry. Um, this might be of interest uh, to some people. This is our measurements. We use uh, MaxDOS, so this is a portable telescope, and we use it for measuring the emissions of NOx and SO2 from large cities. So this is an industrial city. The diagram is showing Sarnia up on, on, the, on the left. Uh, this paper is in draft form. We're gonna be submitting it fairly soon. Um, but we can measure the emissions of SO2 and NOx from a total, total city by driving uh, with this telescope. And we can use this telescope to point up and measure the total vertical column density. So we're measuring the total vertical column um, at each point in space through the troposphere. So we're measuring the total amount of SO2 and NO2. And as we drive around, um, we, we can get a profile for what's coming from this city. So uh, for example, we could have winds from this direction. And so we can integrate this profile and measure the total amount of SO2 or NO2 coming from a city. And we can get intercompare inter that with satellite measurements that's shown in the bottom. So um, these, this is our latest research. Uh, we're, we're using what's called mass balance technique, techniques for measuring emissions from cities, uh, measuring methane from landfills and from the oil sands region in Northern Alberta. And so we can use mass balance equations to measure the total emissions from these sources. Um, just some corrections. We have chemical corrections to the equation due to the fact that NOx will, for example, react as it moves away from the city. So this is a, a correction for that uh, chemical transformation. And these are just some, uh, some emission estimates that we have, and we're comparing these to inventories to see if we're, we're matching the numbers that in, are in the inventories or if the inventories need improvement. All right, so that's my one uh, research uh, example, a, a very quick one. I won't talk about HONO, although if you wanna learn a little bit more, that's quite interesting. And I'll just move towards the end and just uh, have some acknowledgements. That's my research group. 
Uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, people I would thank uh, are, are the, my graduate students who are shown there and undergraduates have, who have done some of the research in our group. I haven't talked a lot about our research. I uh, thought it was more of a, a teaching talk. So I'll finish it there. I'll say thank you all for listening. And uh, I guess you can tell me if we have time for questions or not. <laughs> Thanks for Professor McRae's brilliant and vivid lecture. I think we had a couple minutes for a question. Um, well, I, I saw the question pops up at the chat box. It's from Jack Borson. Why studying at Chen University in Pittsburgh is sometimes get very cold and dry. The amount of salt used on the roads has increased since starting Starting my undergrad, oh sorry, um, has increased since starting yeah, my undergrad, and I've noticed that after taking the bus to get home, I get a large breath of salt. Is there any concern that the amount of salt being used in is causing an increase in salt aerosols, and how may sorry. these aerosols be a concern to the environment? Okay, so we get a large increase in what socks? Did you? And, uh, you, you can uh, find the uh, question on the chat box. We have the chat box. The Jacob Bolton is a uh, concern about the uh, salt being used. The amount of salt being used causing the increase in salt aerosols, and oh. how many aerosol can concern to the environment. Okay, um, good question. Salt aerosols and salt that's being used on roadways. I mean, this is of interest to us. I am not sure about the direct uh, health effects of breathing in salt aerosols. Um, on the one hand, I would say humans have probably evolved to that, um, that salt may not be too bad for you. Um, uh, because lots of us live close to the ocean and have for a long time. And so maybe we have evolved to adapt to a certain amount of salt that's taken into our, uh, our lungs. But I'm not a health expert on that, and so you shouldn't believe me on that. That's just my initial guess. However, our interest is um, in, in salt on roadways, say in Toronto, is the fact that it could be a source of nitro chloride. So it is changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. Um, so salt uh, on roadways would go into the aerosols as chloride, and N2O5 can react with the chloride in those aerosols to form nitro chloride. And nitro chloride photolyzes to, to release chlorine atoms. And so um, it's ultimately, uh, the, the use of salt could be changing the amount of chlorine chemistry that's going on in cities. And we've been looking for this um, in some of our research. Certainly people have measured nitro chloride in cities that are far removed from oceans. So normally, if you think of this as a chloride source, you would think, well, if you're close to the ocean, there's gonna be lots of chloride in the aerosols close to the ocean and so, People have measured high levels of nitro chloride in um, coastal areas, but they're also starting to measure it inland. So some of the original papers by Brown in Colorado, they measured high nitro chloride there. And that could be due to salt use on the road. And it's certainly been measured in Toronto, it's been measured in Calgary. And again, that could be related to the use of salt on roadways, which is increasing the chlorine and the chlorine radical chemistry that's going on in cities. All right. Uh, we have a question from Professor Dow Evans. Uh, the question is, uh, first you sent Professor McLaren the very informative talk, and the modeling of the speciation versus distance from a source that you discuss seems to fit situation like Toronto or the oil sands in Alberta. My question is, can you work with some modeling approaches in a situation such as the Oco Delta? Uh, well, well, yeah, why I come from, and where you have many large cities and a population of approximately a yeah, hundred million over the distance of about 100 kilometers. 
I didn't okay. quite understand the the, the, the questions kind of is, yeah. is are these can I get access to these questions by touching? Yes, professor. Yeah, you can uh, move the cursors on the higher part of your screen, and there is a um, uh, a panel which is a plus, and you can click on that, and you see the chat options. So yeah, which one? Oh, yeah, the chat. Right. And so if I go to chat, what do I click? Can you just click? Uh, can you just click on the the chat options so that you can see the the window that pop out? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So this um, so Professor Zeng is talking about the question from Professor uh, Douglas Evans. Doug Evans, uh, thanks for very okay. The modeling of speciation versus distance from a source that you discussed seems to fit situations like Toronto or the oil sands in Alberta. My question is, uh, can you work with the same modeling approach in a situation such as the Pearl Delta, where Professor Zeng comes from, where you have many very large cities in a population of approximately 100 million over a distance of, a, of about 100 kilometers? Um, the modeling of speciation versus distance. Well, certainly, I don't know if you're talking uh, of about photochemical modeling, um, but certainly, uh, if you're do, if you're talking about photochemical modeling, that can certainly be done for uh, large cities, and probably has been done. I'm certain there is a lot of photochemical modeling that's been done for the Pearl Delta region. Um, uh, earlier in my career, we have done photochemical modeling for a whole, the whole city of Vancouver, for example, and we answered questions in those photochemical modeling uh, studies to answer questions such as if you replace all the vehicles with natural gas vehicles, or if you use reformulated fuel instead of regular fuel, or if you use propane fuels, what impact would that have on air quality in the city? So that can certainly be done for a city of about 2 million people in Vancouver, and I see no reason why similar modeling cannot be done for uh, a larger region. And certainly, uh, I, I'm sure that such modeling is being done in China at the current time. The difference between models then and now uh, are, are that a lot of the models then just focused on ozone chemistry, but now a lot of them have aerosol modules in them. And so they can model the formation of, of aerosols and, and predict what uh, the differences you would get in aerosols due to different control strategies. Okay. Um, uh, we have really, the, the nature of my question. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say the nature of my question is where you have uh, a series of large cities very close to each other uh, and you don't have the kind of washout or um, sort of uh, exponential uh, decays that you were showing in your spatial modeling. And I was just wondering how you handle that sort of situation. Well, I don't do uh, a lot of photochemical modeling anymore, but uh, the, the way that you would handle that is um, you would use a nested grid model. So if you had multiple cities, um, so nested grid models, they can be doubly or triply nested where the, um, the model could be very coarse on the outside. In fact, it could be global on the outside. And then you have nested uh, very fine structure in the cities that you're interested in. So uh, pollu pollution that's being transmitted from one city to another would be represented in that model on a coarse scale. And then you could focus in on one city. So for example, you could have a, um, a, a, a hundred kilometer grid over a very large area. And then if the model can be nested in the fine cities that you're interested in. So you could, ha you could have a nested grid of say one kilometer spatial resolution uh, and do photochemical modeling for the one city that you're interested in. And that would take into account the transport of pollution from cities that are further away and their chemistry as they evolve. So yeah, this is certainly doable and, and people, people do this. Um, I did it in a former life, but I haven't done it in a long time. All right, we, we have the last few questions. Are these written down? Can I? Uh, well, why is Berlin? Right. 
Um, Lynn said, there are many terrible warm gases in the world. Can we reduce them with the help of chemical reactions? Hmm. That's the method. So how can we reduce it using the chemical reaction? Well, uh, I'm not one for, uh, I mean, the atmosphere tends to cleanse itself. Uh, so gases, I think what they mean by warm gases, perhaps, is um, whoever wrote this question, perhaps the warm gases, uh, you're talking about uh, greenhouse gases. So you're talking about CO2 and methane. Um, can we reduce them with the help of chemical reactions? That would be a very big task. <clears throat> you know, certain people are doing capture of, of greenhouse gases. So, um, but I'm really not a person that, uh, you know, adheres to these, what I call end of the pipe solutions. Um, I prefer uh, beginning of the pipe solutions. So in other words, you reduce the emissions of these gases to begin with, rather than allowing them to continue to be emitted and then figuring out how to get rid of them after they've gone into the atmosphere. So uh, I really think the best way is to reduce emissions from the start. Um, you know, so geoengineering is, is something that people are considering to, to solve global warming um, is to carry out emission of sulfur species and putting them into the stratosphere so that they form sulfuric acid aerosols and basically they form little tiny mirrors. So they're going to reflect light away from the planet and cool the planet in that way. So that's, uh, you know, sulfur engineering, I guess they call it, uh, of the atmosphere. Um, and again, I'm not really an advocate for that because uh, I think every time we try to interfere with what's going on naturally, uh, we may think we know all the answers, but we don't. There's always side effects that we, we don't know about. And you know, the prime example is uh, the production of CFCs. Wonderful chemical compounds, beautifully engineered. They uh, created a better life for all of us by using CFCs and providing refrigeration improve the health of populations because people were keeping their food cool in their refrigerators. Uh, what we didn't see were the unexpected effects, the ones that we didn't know anything about, you know, and these species, they're not toxic. You can breathe them in in your home. So a CFC will not hurt you if you breathe it in. But the un unintended consequence is when you put it into the stratosphere and the chemistry that's unknown. That chemistry was not known, not known. And that's why a Nobel Prize was awarded in 1995 to uh, Critzen uh, and Molina and Sherwood Rowland for, uh, uh, for first predicting what that, for, for talking about that chemistry and, uh, uh, you know, finding out the losses of ozone and formation of ozone in the stratosphere. And then in advance, predicting that these compounds would result in a loss of ozone in the long term and that we better stop emitting them. So uh, they were adhering to a, a front of the pipe solution to the problem because they knew the chemistry was going to happen eventually. It wasn't seen until 1985, but they wrote their paper in 1974. And that's one of the reasons they the price. All right, so uh, that's my short answer, long answer. All right, um, we have the last question from the Wasting Ken. What kind of landfill are mainly associated with the medicine? What kind of landfill ingredients are mainly associated with methane? If you could name some, well, most of it's um, most of it is organics that are thrown into landfills. So the process of emitting methane from the landfill is um, it requires um, methanogens, and so food. I can't name the organics. It's it's a lot of organics that we throw into a landfill, and wherever you have organics in a landfill. Um, methanogens, bacteria, are going to eat them up under anaerobic conditions and they're going to produce methane. So the biggest landfill that we have, uh, one of the biggest landfills we have, is the permafrost region in, in the northern regions. So that's essentially a landfill. We have organic, just organic matter, plant material, that's been buried there and frozen for uh, thousands of years. Um, and if it warms and suddenly releases, if it unfreezes and warms up a little bit and it, we have anaerobic conditions there, 
bacteria will naturally take over and will chew up that uh, organic material and will release methane. So it's not individual chemicals, it's a whole host of uh, organic chemical species. So in a landfill, there's lots of them. I mean, we have a landfill close to us here that we've gone and measured uh, the methane emissions quite large. This is from a landfill that's close. Eventually the methane production from those landfills turns on. And uh, you know, you can, you can take measures to capture that methane. So a lot of people are doing that. A lot of landfills do that. They actually have piping systems underneath the landfill to collect the gases, they collect the methane, and they will burn the methane and produce electricity, which is a very good use. It's a very good way to attack that problem, is instead of releasing the methane to the atmosphere, you actually collect it and burn it and, and do something useful with it, with, with, with it, the energy from it. And so that's, that's a very good solution to that problem, I think. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, well, we, at last, we want to thank uh, Professor McLaren again for your wonderful presentation. And I would remind you that next week we have the uh, lecture qualifying the health risk of air pollution from Professor Zheming Chen from St. Louis University. So I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Oh, thank you, Michael Laren. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Professor Malaran, again, yeah, for your time and then uh, for these wonderful lectures. Okay. Thank wonderful. you. Bye, thank all. You. Bye, bye.